I'm Spencer Mazik, and joining me now is Joe Smolinski. He is a finance and restructuring partner at Wagacho, who represents Reader's Digest Association in its latest Chapter 11 restructuring, which was filed on February 17th. Welcome, Joe. Thank you for joining us today. Great to be here, Spencer. So, Joe, as you know, this is the publisher's second filing in less than four years. So before we get to the recent filing, can you tell us what caused the company to file for bankruptcy back in 2009? I think there were a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason is the company was no doubt overlevered. Uh, they had approximately $2.2 .2 million of debt that had to be restructured as a result of a taking, pro a taking private transaction that occurred before the filing. Um, in addition, they were suffering the headwinds of uh, what was happening in the, in the media industry in general. Uh, there was the switch to digital. Uh, they weren't really seeing the, the true effects of it, uh, but it was hitting their revenue line. Um, and, of course, the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 wasn't helping. Um, what's interesting is that you had this digital transformation, but if you look at the disclosure statement that was filed in connection with the plan, it talks mostly about the recession and, right. and the impacts that it was ha having generally on the, on, the, on the industry and the business. Well, so Reader's Digest emerged from bankruptcy in 2010 with its debt reduced by more than $2 billion. And I know you didn't represent the firm at the time, but uh, do you have a sense of what the strategy was then to improve its balance sheet apart from reducing its debt load? Well, they had some basic strategies, but I don't think they really felt that there was a major sea change in the industry yet. Um, they, they, Reader's Digest, of course, is an iconic brand. It was still doing well. The magazine was, it was, it was still doing well. It's still doing well today. Um, but you have to understand, in 2009, the e-readers had not yet really mm -hmm. invaded the marketplace. Um, the switch to digital was not as major, drastic change uh, as, as it, it came to pass. So they certainly did have a business plan and, and changes, but, but they were fully ready to invest in all of the assets in, in their, current, their current form. When in recent years, didn't it also try to sell off some of its businesses as a way to generate cash? It, it did, and, and, and part of that was as revenue continued to drop, and in some markets, like direct, mar direct marketing, uh, which is very big for the company internationally, uh, when the revenue st started dropping, there was a real need to take some, uh, some drastic uh, changes. Um, and, and the company did go about and sell certain of their businesses, like, like all recipes. All recipes yeah. um, that was a great business. Uh, it, had, uh, it had good, good, um, good prospects, uh, but it wasn't yet creating a lot of cash flow. Uh, and and uh, when all recipes was targeted for sale, focus was more on cash flow than it was previously. It also needed a lot of investment. So um, it was lucky that actually it was a good time in the market to actually sell that uh, sell that name, and, and, and retrospectively, it was a very good transaction. For the yeah, company. it generated $175 million for the company there. But is it true that Reader's Digest also hired advisors back in 2011 in an effort to sell itself for about a billion dollars? Uh, it, it did. It was, uh, they, they certainly wanted to uh, explore uh, opportunities to um, to monetize their investment and, and to sell the company. So uh, whatever the strategy was in 2010, it's clear that it didn't work because here we are again with the company filing for Chapter 11. But uh, do you think this is because we now live in a digital media world? You referenced that earlier, but has this traditional print publisher just hasn't been able to keep up? Well, about 18 months ago, the company brought in a new CEO, Bob Guth, and Bob Guth has been spending a lot of time looking at the business, uh, looking from bottoms up and figuring out where the company should focus and where the company should invest their, their resources. And he started down the path of a major transformation. Um, part of that was looking at the international businesses and seeing that that model didn't really work for the company and started a process of trying to rationalize that business and to try to license that business. In the, um, domestically, uh, the company's brands were very strong, but it needed to figure out how to monetize those brands in the digital uh, marketplace. And, um, and, and, and the company has great ideas, and part of this, this restructuring is to unlever the balance sheet to allow the company to complete its transformation plan and to make these investments in their brands, which continue to be very valuable. Well, and speaking of the restructuring, on its uh, Chapter 11 documents, Reader's Digest listed assets and debts of more than a billion dollars each. So what does it hope will happen when it exits bankruptcy this time? Um, 
it, under a restructuring plan that the company reached with, with its senior note holders, these are the note holders that uh, kept $550 million on the company coming out of the last bankruptcy, uh, they agreed to convert and all their debt to equity. This was a pre-petition accord, correct? Uh, this, this was. We, we, uh, we started negotiating with them in the fall. Um, part of that process was sitting down with their financial advisors, with their lawyers, and going through the business plan to determine how best to uh, bring the company forward, to simplify the company. Uh, and, and through that process, they agreed with us that the best way to do that was to completely delever the company, to convert all their debt to equity, to allow the company the runway to be able to invest in, the, in their brands. And how is it operating now? Because I think Reader's Digest is still continuing to operate and function, is that right? Absolutely. Re Reader's is actually doing very well. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, whenever you file a Chapter 22, which is what, what's known in the industry as filing a second Chapter 11, there's always a risk uh, that people will react, parties will react very negatively to that. Uh, they think that the company is, doesn't have a future, that it's going to liquidate. And so um, the company was happy to see that as a result of the filing and, and I think the agreement of the, of the creditors to support the company was important to that. The company has been operating, it's been operating well, it's continuing down, down the path with its plan and it'll emerge as a very healthy company. It will emerge as a leaner company. <laughs> so I, I will say, though, do you think the strategy is going to be different than the one that was used back in 2010? Uh, absolutely. And the company is a different company than it was back in 2010. Uh, it is smaller. It doesn't have a lot of the non-core businesses like All Recipes. Uh, Every Day with Every Rachel Day Ray. With Rachel Ray, uh, Daily Reader, uh, Weekly Reader. Um, and, and as a result, uh, the company can can focus its resources on those brands. So uh, flagship brands like um, Taste of Home and Family Handyman can now get the, uh, the focus that it deserves. Uh, and there are some initiatives which are great for Taste of Home, uh, which is really the first social media uh, company. It's, it's that, that magazine uh, takes all its content from its viewers. And so uh, it's sharing of information. Uh, and so part of the restructuring is to use that social media aspect uh, to, to build that brand, cooking schools and things of that nature that will enhance the value of the brand. It sounds like a great idea. Uh, we've seen recently that there have been other iconic brands to go into bankruptcy like Hostess and Kodak, just to name a couple. But with Reader's Digest, do you think that this, brand's, this brand, the name, is strong enough to survive almost anything? It, it, it is, Spencer, because the brands are, 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 are doing well and the company is figuring out how to make this transformation to digital media in a way that, um, that, that, that creates and monetizes uh, those brands. Um, and, and because it's a magazine, because it, it is intellectual property, the avenues which it could choose to take in order to utilize that brand um, is, is, is infinite. If you look at Twinkies, um, Twinkies has a recipe mm -hmm. and everyone expects that recipe and there aren't that many levers to make that more profitable. You could work on cutting manufacturing costs, you can work on cutting costs of logistics, but at the end of the day everyone wants the same recipe and you have to be able to produce it and make money. You could make a chocolate Twinkie or you, <laughs> for St. Patty's Day you could make a green Twinkie, green Twinkie. But, um, but, but, but at the end of the day um, you know, they were uh, they could not reorganize their their brand and, and had to ultimately stop uh, cease operations and, and and sell it. So so were the issues there with Twinkie with Hostess I should say and also Kodak were they similar to the issues here were they different from the issues with uh, Reader's Digest? Some are. Um, you know Bob Guth taught me that it's much easier uh, to uh, to grow a business than to shrink a business. All three of these companies, um, Kodak. Uh, um, Hostess and, and Reader's Digest uh, have been around for decades and over the course of decades that creates a lot of complexity in the operations, structural inefficiencies that are very easy to break down. To give you an example, Reader's Digest uh, as of uh, a year and a half ago had 400 different IT platforms that it was operating on internationally. 400, wow. 400. So when you try to shrink the company it's much more difficult because it always has unintended consequences. Uh, and 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 much much more difficult to figure out where to focus. So, it, it is very similar. Kodak um, had to figure out which of its brands 
uh, it, it, it would shift focus from. And you're seeing that it decided to fo focus its attention not on its camera business, which is what you probably think of when you think of Kodak, and more to its printer business, uh, because that's where the opportunities exist. But getting out of the existing businesses are not easy. It's expensive. Uh, and, and so uh, Readers has some of those same, uh, same issues. So Joe, how did you come to represent the 91-year-old publisher? Well, um, while Gottschall, my firm, started doing work for the company back in 2011, uh, we did a couple of uh, M&A transactions for them, including all recipes, uh, and uh, we did finance work for them. Uh, around the fall of uh, 2012, uh, the questions started. It was never a situation where someone picked up the phone, panicked, and said, <laughs> is there a restructuring yes. lawyer in the house? Uh, it's, it started becoming evident that the company, uh, while it was making great progress in its transformation, was running out of runway. And so the questions started with respect to specific transactions. And then over time, it became obvious that it was not the responsible thing to do to make some of the payments that were ahead of them under their contractual obligations. Uh, and, and as a result, it became time to consider a, a bankruptcy filing or a restructuring. And that's when we started engaging with the, with the note holders and really worked on a business plan that they could get behind. OK. Well, good luck with everything. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Spencer. For more information on this or other topics, subscribe to BloombergLaw.com. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody.